previous module, we stated that the input impedance of a half-wave dipole, if it's driven at its design frequency, is equal to 73 plus J42.5 ohms. However, if the driving frequency changes so that the antenna length is no longer equal to half a wavelength, both the real and imaginary parts of the input impedance change. Formally, the real part of the input impedance may be calculated from this equation, where k is the wave number of the driving signal, equal to 2 pi over lambda, l is the fixed length of the antenna in meters, and r sub r is the radiation resistance. The radiation resistance, in turn, is calculated from this equation, where c is Euler's constant, which is equal to 0 0.5772, eta is the intrinsic impedance of the medium into which the antenna is radiating, so for free space this would be equal to 377 ohms, and the functions s sub i and c sub i are the sine and cosine integrals, which are defined here. Similarly, the imaginary part of the input impedance may be calculated from this equation, where A is the radius of the dipole in meters. Note that all of these equations depend on the product KL, rather than directly on the physical length L of the antenna. This means that the input impedance of the antenna depends on the relationship between the dipole length and the driving frequency, rather than on either of those factors taken individually. Now, we said that k is equal to 2 pi, which is the number of radians in a wavelength, divided by lambda, which is a wavelength. So you can think of k as a conversion factor. You aren't changing the value of L by multiplying by k. You're just changing the units. The physical length L is given in meters, and obviously does not depend on the driving frequency. But the product, KL, which is also a statement of antenna length, has units of radians, and does depend on the driving frequency. So, for example, an antenna with a physical length of 1 meter, if it is driven at 150 megahertz, has an electrical length, KL, of pi radians, or half a wavelength. If that same 1 meter antenna is driven at 300 megahertz, twice the frequency, it will have an electrical length, KL, of 2 pi radians, or one full wavelength. Or, if it's driven at 450 megahertz, it will have an electrical length of 3 pi radians, or one and a half wavelengths. So, the physical length of the antenna is constant, but its properties change with frequency because its electrical length changes with frequency. So, armed with these equations, you can easily write a program in MATLAB or in your calculator to calculate the input impedance of a dipole antenna at any arbitrary driving frequency and radius. I would highly recommend that you do this. It's hard to look at a long equation like this and get any real sense of what's going on but you will get that sense through working with it. In the meantime, though, let's go ahead and look at a few important features. If you use the equations we've just given to calculate the real and imaginary components of the input impedance and plot them versus frequency, this is what you'll get. Note that I have stated the x-axis in terms of dipole length in wavelengths, rather than directly in terms of frequency. That's because, again, neither frequency nor physical length is the most significant factor in determining antenna behavior, but it's the relationship between frequency and physical length that matters. This relationship is directly stated by electrical length, as given here. If I instead plotted the input impedance with respect to frequency, I would also have to specify the length of the antenna in order to communicate the same information that is embedded here by simply plotting with respect to electrical length. However, this x-axis does directly correspond to frequency. It goes from DC, where the wavelength is infinitely long and the length of the antenna is zero wavelengths, up through the half-wave dipole design frequency, where the antenna length is equal to half a wavelength, to twice the design frequency, 
where the wavelength is half as long as the design frequency, and so the dipole length is the length of a full wavelength. So here we see that the dipole antenna, as long, and so the dipole antenna is the length of a full wavelength. So here we see that the dipole antenna is capacitive at low frequencies, goes through a resonance at approximately the half wave frequency, and then becomes inductive at frequencies between the first resonance and the full wave frequency. If we expand our x-axis to go all the way up to the frequency at which the antenna length is two wavelengths, which is four times the design frequency of a half-wave dipole, you can see that the antenna experiences a second resonance at approximately L equals one wavelength, a third resonance at approximately L equals one and a half wavelengths, and a fourth resonance at approximately L equals two wavelengths. This pattern continues, with resonances occurring at every multiple of half a wavelength, and the reactive components swapping back and forth between inductive and capacitive at each resonance. Note also that the real part of the input impedance varies greatly with frequency. At the half wavelength frequency, it's approximately 73 ohms. At a full wavelength, it hits an asymptote and veers toward positive infinity, and at the three halves wavelength, it is approximately 104 ohms. If you wish to operate a dipole antenna efficiently at any frequency, you will need to match your feed to the input impedance of the antenna at that frequency. So of these first three resonance frequencies, the dipole is really only operable as an antenna at the first and third, the half wavelength frequency, and the three halves wavelength frequency.